you don't have some Bienvenidos al Laboratorio Internacional de Partículas Elementales de la Universidad de Guanajuato. Lo fundamos el año 2005 para estudiar las partículas elementales y desarrollar tecnología de detección de radiación, incluyendo rayos cósmicos. Hemos atendido a más de 100 estudiantes de servicio social, 30 estudiantes de licenciatura, 20 estudiantes de maestría y 10 estudiantes de doctorado. Desarrollamos investigación en tecnologías de detección de radiación, Hemos logrado algunas innovaciones que han merecido premios nacionales e internacionales. Colaboramos en experimentos internacionales de primer nivel. Hemos creado el seminario Leo Lederman, difundido internacionalmente a través de medios digitales. Ha llegado a más de un millón de personas, especialmente jóvenes de Latinoamérica, en seis meses. Contamos con invitados internacionales expertos, líderes en su área, de primera línea, exploran las fronteras de la ciencia. Hemos publicado más de 22 libros de divulgación y referencia y más de 100 artículos de ciencia en revistas indexadas a nivel internacional. Los esperamos. Bienvenidos. Let me start in Spanish. Saludos y Agradecimientos desde la Universidad de Guanajuato en colaboración con el programa STEAM de la Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala con la Embajada de los Estados Unidos en Guatemala con la Cátedra Eugenio Méndez de Ocurro y la Escuela Superior de Física y Matemáticas del Instituto Politécnico Nacional en México. Gracias a todos ustedes. Hemos llegado a casi 1.300.000 participantes desde que iniciamos esta serie de seminarios. En promedio tenemos 1.000 participantes por día. Sabemos que nos siguen en este seminario de casi todas las Américas, desde Argentina, Chile, Perú, Colombia, Uruguay, Guatemala, Salvador, México y otros países. También de Europa, como de España y de Alemania, y de la América no hablante en español como Estados Unidos y Canadá. En este seminario tenemos como invitado al profesor Tulika Vos. El profesor Vos es profesor del Departamento de Física, Investigación, Enseñanza y Divulgación de la Ciencia en Física en la Universidad de Wisconsin en Madison, Estados Unidos. Ella imparte este seminario titulado Buscando Nueva Física en los Colisionadores. Searching for New Physics at Colliders. Esperamos que sea de mucho provecho para estudiantes de física y para los estudiantes y público en general. Recibimos sus preguntas por chat. Uh, now, some words in English. Thanks, Professor Tulika, for accepting to speak in this Leo Lederman Leo Lederman seminar. You're very welcome, and the public is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Felix, for this uh, kind introduction. Let me go ahead and share my slides. I think you should be able to see them now. So yes, thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. It, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you all about searching for new physics at Colliders 
with uh, precision and innovation. Just a few words about myself before I get started. Uh, so I'm a professor of physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a member of the, the CMS collaboration at the Large Hadron Collider. I'm currently the deputy program manager for US CMS Software and Computing, but over the years, my uh, research interests have covered standard model measurements, such as for new particles, trigger and data acquisition, as well as software and computing, some of which I will try to cover in my talk today. A little bit about my journey. I, I grew up in India. I went uh, to college at Delhi University and then Cambridge University for my uh, bachelor's before coming to the US to Columbia University for my PhD and then went to Brown as a postdoc before moving on to a faculty position. Overall, I enjoy working on, on challenging tasks in a collaborative setting and, and the particle physics and CMS certainly gives me many opportunities for doing that. Beyond research, I, I like working on outreach, science communication, and in general, improving uh, diversity and inclusion. And in my spare time, I, I like to learn to cook gourmet meals, uh, playing the piano and spending more time with my family. I don't have much to report except this pie-shaped hala bread that I made uh, recently. But from that, uh, let me move on to the main focus of my uh, talk today. So it's particle physics, which most of you know, is the, the study of the smallest known building blocks of the physical universe and the interactions uh, between them. So the focus in this case is on single particles or, or, or small groups of particles. As, as you see at the bottom there, which shows these three particles uh, that you see coming together in a composite particle, which is actually the proton here. And, and the focus is not on billions of atoms or molecules that make up the entire uh, planet or Earth. So all of this comes together in the way you just saw. And let me just go back so that I can explain better what I'm going to show here. So what we have is particles that we collide and then take, for example, two protons that you drive to high energy and then you see what happens. Well, interestingly, you see protons coming in, but a whole lot of mess is created. And in fact, particle collisions at very high energies uh, produce many particles and sometimes, as you can see, more massive than the initial particles. Of course, this is a cartoon. Uh, real collisions obey certain specific rules uh, governed by uh, quantum mechanics. But overall, we've been using particle collisions to actually study particles, both elementary and composite, in, in great detail over the past 50, 60 years. And, and all of this work has, has resulted in what we now know and call as the, the standard model of particle physics. This comprises what's called the electroweak theory by Glashow, Weinberg, and Salam, and then quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of, of strong interactions, which if you take particle physics in, 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 uh, in graduate school, et cetera, you will learn a lot more about. It can be briefly summarized. This is like a one slide summary of that in, into what we know about particles. So this is what you see here on the left, which is what we call are three families or generations of, of quarks and leptons or light particles. Quarks are such as up, down, strain, charm, top, bottom, these have interesting names, and leptons, light particles such as the electron and the muon and perhaps even the tau that you may have heard of. And each of these particles has its uh, sort of what I call corresponding neutral particle or, or the neutrino. Now, most of what we know in the universe, sort of the visible part, is sort of comprised really of this first generation that you see here, up, down, electron, and neutrino. But in addition to all of this, there is another important part of the standard model, and, and that is what comprises what we call these particles here. Now, you're aware of, of certain forces or interactions uh, from maybe some of your work in uh, high school as well as undergrad. And for example, there is the electromagnetic force, ENM, which is carried or mediated by, we say, the, the particle called the photon. In addition, there is the, the strong force which holds the nucleus together, which is mediated by the particle called the gluon. 
Then there is the weak force, which is responsible for beta decay and, and radioactivity. And, and that is mediated by these particles called the W and, and Z bosons. Now, this comes together, and before I go ahead and talk more about this, these are terms that I will be using sometimes, so I would want to familiarize yourself with it. Fermions and bosons, all of the particles that I mentioned in my previous slide can be grouped into to these broad categories. Fermions are particles uh, such as uh, the leptons and quarks that I talked about, which has this quantity that we call spin, intrinsic angular momentum equal to half. And, and on the other hand, the force carrier particles that we talked about are, are mostly what we call spin one particles. There is exception, and I will come to that later. Now, different numbers of quarks, for example, three of these quarks could come together to form something we call a baryon. And in the end, they end up having spin half, three halves, five halves. And then you can have a quark, and it's what is called antiparticle. So every particle we say has an antiparticle that has similar properties, but different charge, opposite charge. So you can have a quark, which has a certain charge, two thirds, one third, which can come together with this anti-quark to form what's called a meson. Now, there's a fundamental difference between the properties of these fermions and bosons. And here is like a little cartoon analogy. You can think of as in two different kinds of, you know, hotels, something called the fermion motel and the boson hotel. And if you think of uh, a family of four coming in or more, and if they go ahead and, and they are of a nature where they don't like sharing rooms, but they want to be in their own individual room here, we say that they are fermions. That is, no two identical particles can occupy the same quantum state. On the other hand, you can have bosons who are very friendly. They don't mind sharing rooms and all of them group or cluster together. And, and, and this is uh, the basis of what you also probably might have heard of, the Pauli exclusion principle that we are classifying these. Now, all of this, worked beautifully for massless quanta, for the photon and the gluon, but then we started seeing issues that we couldn't really explain when we started looking at more massive particles, such as the, the W and, and Z bosons, or when we started to look at, for example, the masses of all of the leptons and quarks, we saw there was a huge range in their masses, from very, very tiny neutrinos and electrons, muons, and taus, to the gigantic uh, top quark, which is shown here. This is all in scale of mass. So clearly it, it indicated to us that the, the standard model as we knew it at that time uh, was incomplete in the sense that there was something else that was needed. Some assembly was required to explain it and, and, and this or understand its features. And then this is what led to the idea of what's called the Higgs. And I will talk more about this in a second. And in principle, we need this for understanding how elementary particles uh, get their mass. So you can think of the standard model as being something which worked very beautifully for, for a number of years. However, some things were incomplete. Some assembly was required. And another important piece, which you might have realized as you saw all of the forces that I had listed earlier, the electromagnetic, strong, weak. And uh, I mentioned, I did not mention a fundamental force that we experience in our everyday lives. That is the force of gravity. Gravity was not or is not included in our current understanding of the standard model. And this is a, a big open question. Now, in order to understand the Higgs, it's, it's useful sometimes to look at some analogies because it's a very, you know, challenging theoretical concept, really. And for that, I, I invite you to take a look at this picture, which shows uh, a parachute and then a person attached to it, and they are, say, falling down through the air. And then so the question is, if you were in this position, for example, uh, what would you rather have, an unopened parachute or a fully opened parachute? And I think almost all of you will agree that what you really want is a fully open parachute because that's the safest way to come onto the ground. And, and here, what is happening is that there is interaction with the medium, which is air, and this lowers the speed of the drop, making it a safe uh, sort of fall to the ground. 
In a similar way, you can think of the Higgs field as something that is permeating all of the space and, and particles are interacting with it with different strengths. And depending on the interaction, if there is larger interaction with the medium, for example, that determines what kind of mass the particle has. I'll use another analogy to explain this because this is really an important, very, very important piece of, of, of what we work on. And this is a set of cartoons that were actually uh, devised by David Miller uh, from University College London in response to a request from the then Prime Minister of England, Margaret Thatcher, who wanted to understand what the Higgs was all about. So for that, you can think of that there is a room and this room is really full of, of people. And these could be physicists at a conference or political party workers, as was the case there. And they're all talking to each other. Then what you have is a famous person who walks or enters the door. And as people realize that this famous person is there, they start questioning, oh, what's going on? Why is he here, et cetera? And imagine a situation where this famous person who's entered the room here is now trying to make uh, his or her way to the other end of the room. Are they going to easily whiz through the room? No, they can't, because as they go through the room, groups of people cluster around them, trying to want to talk to them. You know, why are you here? What are you up to these days? And, and so the emotion of this person is sort of slowed down as they make their way from one end of the room to the other. It's like they have acquired mass. It's like there are heavy massive objects move slowly. So they're slowing down is sort of similar to their picking up mass. That is the more they interact and talk with the groups of people around them, the more slowed down they have. And so this is this interaction with this field or this group of people that gives this person essentially their mass and in our world, a particle and how it interacts with this field around it is what gives us its mass. Now let's imagine a scenario where a complete nobody instead of this famous person walked in. If this complete nobody is now entering the door and they wanna to get to the other end of the door, is anything going to happen? Are people going to want to talk to them, slow them down? No, that person is going to like whiz through the room and is able to easily get to the other end of the room. So they have very minimal interaction and as a result of that minimal interaction, it seems like they have almost no mass. They can go through in a very speedy manner. So again, this is the same principle. That is, you have a certain uh, interaction with the field that exists. And depending on that interaction, you have masses that are being generated. So this idea actually was brought together by a number of people. Uh, you see them uh, listed here who essentially came up with this individually or in, in, in three different groups that uh, were then um, all in the year 1964. So the basic um, idea was the same, though they were written from different perspectives. And, and, and three people, uh, Goralek, Kibble, Hagen, Higgs, Angler, and Braut, who came about with this idea of what has now come to be called the Higgs mechanism resulting in three very important papers that laid the foundation of this work in, in 1964. So to summarize, imagine that there is this field that permeates the entire universe. Every particle feels this field, but is affected in different amounts. And the more a particle interacts with this invisible field, the more mass it gets. So now I use this term invisible field. So with that, you're going to ask me, but if this field is invisible, how can we prove that it exists? Well, for that, the way we do about it is we take advantage of the fact that this theory predicts that associated with this field is a particle, the Higgs particle. And what we try to do in our experiment is actually to hunt or look for this Higgs particle. If we were to find this Higgs particle, and this was what we set out to do, then we could in a way verify that the Higgs mechanism was correct. So what we tried to do is to create the Higgs boson in our experiment, but we were faced with a challenge that the theories 
did not predict what the mass of the Higgs particle was to be. So we were really looking in a very, very wide range in as diverse ways as was possible. But that was not the only question. There were several other questions that we were set out to do with uh, and work on with colliders. One of them is related to what I've already mentioned, that there is this very large mass hierarchy in the fermion sector. If you look at the masses of the, the quarks and the leptons, they are ranging from very little to very large as in the top quark. And then, of course, you've heard me mention the number three a few times. I've said there are three quarks of three generations of quarks and leptons. But why three? What is magical about three? Why are they exactly three generations? Well, we don't know. There could be more. In fact, that's something we've been searching for and looking for as well. Then there is the question of uh, how do we explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe? I don't know if, if some of you have watched this movie called Angels and Demons. It's an interesting movie. It's based at CERN. If you get the time, uh, try to watch it. But its actor is, uh, main actor is uh, Tom Hanks. So I am now using that as an analogy to say, let's imagine a scenario where there is Tom Hanks, but he would look very much like actually anti-Tom Hanks. That is his anti-particle, very much similar in, in properties, except for, as I've mentioned, the charge. And, and so Tom Hanks looks very much similar to anti-Tom Hanks. And now if they were to come together and to meet each other, well, they would completely annihilate. Now at the start of the universe, the start of the Big Bang, we talked about, uh, we, we know that matter and antimatter were all there, equal quantities. But what we, what, what we see around us today, we are all matter and we exist and there is no naturally occurring antimatter that is in sight. So where did all the antimatter go? And why are we left with this world that is so matter dominated? We don't actually know the answer to this question, though there are lots of ideas of, of, of trying to explain this. Then there is a question that if we look at our universe, only about 5% of it is what we called the visible, meaning, we, we see it, we understand its interactions, and this is all that I've been talking about, all our quarks and leptons, et cetera. A large fraction of it is, is what we call dark, meaning we can't really see it, we can only infer its presence. For example, about 25% of it is what we call dark matter. That is, we don't know it, what it is or what it is comprised of, we can only infer its presence through actually gravitational interactions. So what is responsible for dark matter? This is a big open question for us that we try to understand and address at colliders. Are new particles the solution? And no, they're not particles like Darth Vader who are dark in our movies, but perhaps there could be connections, for example, between new completely exotic particles we haven't discovered, or perhaps the Higgs might have something to do with it and, and, and could lead to dark matter. These are all open questions that we are trying to answer. And then of course, the question that I already mentioned to you earlier, the question of gravity. This is a mug that you can buy at CERN, which has the standard model Lagrangian in short on it. And, and a big important piece that's missing there is the fundamental force of gravity. What and where is gravity? Now, there are lots and lots of interesting ideas out there to try and explain what could be responsible or how we could answer some of these questions. For example, there are theories such as supersymmetry, which predicts that every standard model particle that we know of has a partner particle that is sort of what we call a supersymmetric particle. And so perhaps what we've seen is half of the overall total number of particles because we've seen the standard model particles and the supersymmetric particles are still left there for us to discover. Then there are the ideas of what I call extra dimensions. Uh, we know of the world as in, you know, three plus one standard uh, dimensions, but maybe there are more dimensions. Maybe some of them are really small and curled up and compactified. And, and perhaps it's in one of these dimensions that gravity reigns and is strong and supreme, while in our uh, dimensions that we are aware of, it is not so. So 
are there these extra dimensions? Are there particles that could be in these extra dimensions that we don't ordinarily see? Well, these are some of the questions that we are trying to answer. How do we do that? Well, we try to... Do yes. you want to take some questions? Sure, I, I think this is a good time. I'll take some questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, people are sending greetings to you from Miami, United States, Mexico, Peru, Guatemala. And uh, people is asking that why fermions are fermions and why bosons are bosons? Uh, th these are excellent questions. And in fact, that's a fundamental question. Why are particles the way they are? Well, we fundamentally don't know why. We just know that these particles have these properties and, and some particles end up having these particles, which means that they follow this kind of statistics that we call Fermi-Dirac statistics. And in another set of particles, which are, are actually fall, seem to have properties which align well with what we call bosons, they follow what we know as Bose-Einstein statistics. But fundamentally, uh, you know, if, if a new particle were to be discovered, for example, uh, whether, whether it will be a fermion or a boson, I, I cannot really predict. Um, so this came about as a result of the way the standard model was constructed by grouping particles and, and looking at, at, at symmetries and, and, and their interactions. Uh, but it's an excellent question. Thank you. People is asking you, how does the G2 experiment results affect our understanding of physics phenomena and the standard model? Uh, could you just say what was the first question? What kind of experiments? It's, uh, the experimental results. Oh, absolutely. So that's again an important question because what you know, I'm, I'm I'm talking about, for example, I mean, I'm going to address in the next set of slides how exactly using experiments we discover those, but. A lot of the times, for example, in 1964, a group of theorists came up with these predictions, which said, oh, maybe there is a Higgs boson. But until you can experimentally prove it, you don't know whether that's true or wrong. So uh, what we are trying or what we've been trying to do at our experiments is actually hunt for these particles. So sometimes by our experimental results, we can validate theories and say that this theory was right. And sometimes we can look at our experimental results and say, these theories are completely incorrect and wrong. So the experimental results go hand in hand with the theoretical development to try and figure out what is, is, is correct and well-founded and what perhaps may not be. Thank you very much. Miguel has a question. Can you say about yourself, Miguel? Hello. Hello. Hello, doctor. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear your talk. Very interesting. You said that there are several uh, potential answers for dark matter. What, what, uh, what could be uh, according? What do you think? What, what would you? Which, uh, which choice? Which um, um, potential answer would you choose? I mean, what do you think about the? existence of dark, dark matter? Uh, a very excellent, an excellent question. So I would say on, on the basis of what we have seen in our data so far, uh, some of the what were commonly known ideas that is dark matter is, is perhaps as weakly interacting massive particle are, are less likely to be true. But maybe there is a more complicated answer to dark matter. And, and, and one of these is, is related to perhaps there being like, you know, a, a completely a dark sector, which is in sort of parallel to our sort of sector. And then the Higgs boson can act as a, a portal to this dark sector. And, and maybe they are invisible decays of the Higgs that we will find that can prove this or disprove it. That's the one that I am looking for in my experiment. And so I know there are other interesting ideas as well. New particles called axions, for example, which could also help explain. So it's a very rich field at the moment. 
Great. Thanks a lot Thank for you. the answer. Shall we continue, Tolik? Sure. Thank yes. You. So I think this was a good time because I've, I've talked about sort of the, the theoretical motivation for why we do the experiment that I'm going to talk about next. And then this is because we are really trying to answer these questions, look for new physics, and then we kind of do this in a two different ways. One is by looking very, very closely, so with a lot of precision using new techniques, and the other is just looking in new places by just putting in more and more energy to see what we can produce or by just doing new measurements that we haven't done before. And so this takes me to uh, the lab where I work, which is what we call the CERN lab, which is uh, situated just outside uh, Geneva in, in Switzerland, is actually at the border of France and Switzerland. And uh, it is here that we've been colliding beams of protons together at increasing energy over the years to see what happens as a result of those collisions. What are we able to produce? What new physics is it can be unearthed? And over the course, since the start of the, the Large Hadron Collider, as it's called, the LHC in, in, two, in 2010, uh, we've had different collision energies uh, as a result of the upgrades uh, of, the, of the collider from seven trillion electron volts to eight trillion electron volts, to the most uh, recent run, which was called run two, where we had a collision energy of 13 trillion electron volts. And the run that is currently ongoing, we call it run three, uh, which is at about 13.6. And so we're colliding literally protons, which are, you know, uh, which have about, in, in, in the case of run two, for example, 6.8 trillion uh, electron volts with bunches of protons with 6.5 five trillion electron volts, they come to collide at certain points, and which are shown by these dots that you see here at, at four distinct points, which is where we instrument the detectors. Now, I should point out that these uh, protons are really traveling at close to the speed of light. And then this uh, ring around is about 16.8 miles or 27 kilometers and they are going at about 11k times a second. And I've listed there the kind of speed you will have in miles per hour. So you can now compare it to a car or even a train speed to see how different it is. Uh, this is about 300 feet underground. We have about 1,200 uh, magnets that are responsible for bending the beams and then making them collide, et cetera. And, and it's really cool to about 1.9 Kelvin. So that's almost like being in outer space. And, and the, the energy of the beam is about 362 megajoules, which you know, may not sound surprising, but it is surprising when you compare it to, for example, an equivalent number of uh, TNT, which is about 90 kilograms of TNT. And what I personally found very scary because of my fondness for Swiss chocolate was 15 kilograms of chocolate. So there's a lot of energy in that beam. And therefore, when they come together and collide, you can really have some of the hottest reactions in our galaxy. And then you can look at what kind of temperatures these uh, correspond to. It's a huge number, as you can see in, in Zandegrite. And around that point, we instrument our detectors such that we can observe what happens out of that collision. If you remember my cartoon at the very beginning with the balls colliding and what's happening out. And so here in the middle of the detector, this is a CMS detector, my experiment before it was uh, closed up. And then you can get an idea of its scale by the size of the person who is uh, standing here. So it is uh, a rather massive detector. And it really acts like what I would call a gigapixel camera, which is just taking a billion pictures of interactions per second. And what we analyze is are those interactions. There are actually four experiments situated around this ring, and uh, there are two called ATLAS and, and CMS, a CMS compact muon solenoid experiment I work on. ATLAS and CMS are two general purpose experiments that do a wide variety of particle physics. There is another one called LHCB, which studies specifically the physics of B quarks, and then the ALICE experiment, which studies uh, heavy ion collisions. The CMS detector, uh, it took about 2000 scientists and engineers more than 20 years to build. It's a rather complicated uh, detector. It's about 15 meters wide and 21 meters long. It weighs about twice as much as the Eiffel Tower, or if it helps you, about 40 large airplanes. 
and, and, and there are different pieces to it. And I will talk briefly about how they're used to detect different particles. And what are these particles? So we've talked about photons, the light quanta, electrons, the lightest electrically charged lepton, muons, the heavier cousin of the electron, charged hadrons, which are composite particles, which are made of quarks, such as protons we've talked about. There are others such as pions, kaons, and lots and lots of them. There are composite neutral particles that are made of quarks, such as, for example, neutrons that you may know, as well as others. Now, how does a detector work? We actually have different types of detectors which use different technology, and then they try to harness important features of these particles. So for example, at the very center, we have something called the uh, tracking detector, which makes use of silicon technology and a charged particle, when it goes through such a tracking detector, leaves hits and we can sort of form a track, you know, it's like footsteps on the snow, which allows us to figure out how somebody is walking. And so we can figure out the path a particle takes. In this case, I'll start with the muon that you will see goes through the tracker. So it leaves a track and ultimately on the right hand side are dedicated muon detectors where we can figure out properties of the muon, what kind of momentum it has, et cetera. Then there is the electron, which also is charged, so it will leave a track in the silicon tracker, and then it goes and it deposits an energy in a detector that we call the calorimeter, and this one is the electromagnetic calorimeter, which is specifically designed to collect energies from particles that interact electromagnetically, such as the electron and also the, the, the photon I'll come to in a second. There is a charged hadron, which will also leave a track in the tracking detector, and it deposits an energy in a dedicated um, detector we set up, which called the hadron calorimeter, which is designed specifically for hadrons. So now, using these different signatures, we can start to differentiate what may be a hadron from what is an electron with what is a, a muon, for example. Then now I just talked about a charged hadron, but what about a neutral hadron? So a neutral hadron is different from a charged hadron because it will no longer leave a track in the tracking detector, which is going after charged particles. All it will do is leave a deposit, an energy deposit in the hadron calorimeter. So now we can distinguish it from the charged particle. And there's a photon, which is also neutral, so it's not going to leave a track in the tracking detector, but rather it will just deposit its energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter. So these signatures allow us to figure out what particles are being produced and how they're interacting with the detectors helps us figure out their properties. And then there is the neutrino, the light neutral particle that actually does not interact in our detector at all. It sort of goes through it and we can only sort of infer its presence by applying principles of physics, such as conservation of energy and momentum. We find something missing and we attribute it to, for example, a potential neutrino. Now, all of this was a detectors, but there is a huge challenge associated with our experiments. And then this comes about that if you look at the the rate of the interactions happening, uh, that's about 10 to the power nine per second. And these bunches of protons are colliding every 25 nanoseconds. So at a rate of about 40 million times a second, 40 megahertz. All of the money and the resources and the facilities that we have allow us to write out data and store it at the rate of only about 2000 hertz. So 200 events per second. So there is this huge gap between what is actually happening and what we can store. And it is complicated even further by the fact that the things we want to discover, they're actually quite rare. And so what we wanna be able to do is extract this extremely rare discovery signal from the huge mess of data. And, and, and that means we have to have large scale processing and data management. Here is this cartoon which shows you if all of the CDs are stacked with just the one year of LHC data, they are as high or above higher than where a plane flies, you know, perhaps where an air balloon is and higher than the tallest sort of mountain in the Geneva area. 
So it's like looking for a needle in a haystack when we are trying to find the interesting new physics signals, such as, for example, the Higgs boson that we were so interested in. Not just that, well, you don't have one proton interacting and colliding with another proton. You have bunches of proton colliding with bunches of protons. So you have more than one proton-proton interaction. You have several, and we call this uh, overlap events or additional events or pila. And, and when the LHC was designed, our detectors were designed, we were expecting about 25 such events. What we see already in our data is, is way more. And why this gets complicated is because in the end, we are able to need to figure out what is produced and where it came from. That is, which proton-proton interaction it came from. We don't want to find the end products from a different proton-proton interaction and assume it came for a different one, because that will lead to results that don't make sense. So you see here a cartoon or an event actually which shows about 78 vertices that were reconstructed where there was, for example, a proton-proton interaction. And we want to figure out all of what comes out of that. So it's, it's quite challenging. As in another example, I'll show you. So uh, the Higgs particle that we say we're looking at to discover decays into two Z bosons. And each of the Zs decays into two muons. So now you have a final state, which has four muons. And this was supposed to be a golden signature. We said, nice, clean way of identifying four muons. And we'll know we have the Higgs. When we first started looking at simulations of it, this is what we saw. And as you can see, this is just a mess. We can't figure out what is the muon here or, or where it's coming from. And then that is because you have to apply certain requirements that helps to eliminate and get rid of the pileup events that we talked about. So for example, if we require that we have tracks with a certain momentum, you can see it cleaning up. And now you have these four muons in addition that you can see very clearly in the picture. But the complication is that you have to find this from the mess. And this, and not the Higgs, is repeating every 25 nanoseconds because collisions are happening 25 nanoseconds. I can't simulate that, but this is to just give you an idea of the rate at which the events are happening. So the challenge is to really figure out where is that interesting event? Where is that needle in the haystack? And, and the solution to this is what we call the trigger. In reality, this is not what it looks like, but rather it looks like this. This is an electronics board that I actually worked on as part of my PhD thesis. So I have very fond memories. So I always like to include a picture of it, but that was a while ago. So this is a modern day version of an electronics board that we are using in the CMS experiment to actually make some of these decisions regarding what's interesting and what we should keep because it may be that needle in the haystack and then what we should throw away. So this is then a description of how we do that. Uh, my experiment has, we call like a two level system for doing this, for selecting what are the interesting collisions to keep. So as I've mentioned, the collision rate is, is 40 megahertz. We have what we call custom electronic boards, things we have built and designed, and we have algorithms that run on that, which use information from the calorimeter and muon detectors and they make certain very fast decision in the order of, you know, uh, microseconds, uh, three microseconds. In fact, whether this event looks interesting, and if so, I keep it. If it's not, just get rid of it. And it's doing it in such a way that we are able to select about 100 kilohertz. So 100 kilo events per second. And what passes this, what we call the level one trigger, then goes on to a farm of what used to be commercial CPUs and now also graphics processing units or GPUs. And here you have C++ algorithms that run and try to make more precise uh, decisions based on this input rate of 100 kilohertz. And, and then uh, we write out about the order of a, a, a few kilohertz, one or two kilohertz. I should point out that the real hard limit is actually not the rate that it is one kilohertz or two kilohertz, but rather the bandwidth. That means how large the events are and the rate combined, because that uh, impacts how we transfer data from our online file system to actual storage at the end. So this is an, you know, a brief summary of what our, our trigger system looks like. 
But the thing which kept people like me who worked on the trigger awake at night sometimes at the start of the LHC was if you look at it, you have about 10 to the power nine events per second coming in into your first level trigger, out of which you're literally throwing away about 99.99% of them, keeping about 10 to the power five events per second, which then goes on into this farm of you know, CPUs and GPUs that I mentioned, where at this high level trigger, again, you reject about 99.9%, uh, .9%, keeping only about 1,000 or so or 2,000 events per second. So now these are the events that we store for analysis. Now, imagine you are doing an analysis and you have your analysis code and you're trying to find that supersymmetric particle or dark matter. And, and six months down the line, you find out that you have a bug in your code. Well, what do you do? You just go fix your bug and do your analysis. And there you go, you can rerun again. But what about the events that got thrown away at the level one and HLT. What if there was a bug there or something you forgot to anticipate? Well, those events are gone forever. There is just no way of undoing that. So an important question really for us was, is our sort of favorite new physics signal included in the very small fraction of, of selected events that we wrote out? And this was the, the challenge of the trigger that we tried to address in, in many different ways. But we were able to, and in fact, as a result of all of this work, the, the CERN experiments were actually in 2012, able to observe a particle that was consistent with the long sought hit boson. And this was announced about almost 11 years ago, 4th of July, 2012, by both the ATLAS and CMS experiments who presented their results and said that they observed a new particle which had a mass and, and both of them independently found that this particle had a mass at around about 125 giga electron volts or, or GeV. This is one of those events, I call it like a groundbreaking event. You ask people in my field where they were that day on 4th of July and they can probably tell you where they were because we all remember where we were when the announcement was made. Before I go further, I will uh, talk briefly about a few different things that I will mention. And one of these is what we call Feynman diagrams because these are uh, pictorial representations of different processes that lead to the production of the different particles that, you know, such as the Higgs boson that I will Julica, talk about. Do you want yes. to take uh, more sure. questions? Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Uh, people is asking, what is a neutrino? Very good question. So a neutrino is a particle which uh, was uh, found to have very interesting properties in the sense that it was very, it, it was neutral. And then it turns out that each of these uh, particles such as the, the electron, muon and tau have a particle, have a neutrino that's associated with it. And, and when um, the particle was discovered, uh, not much was known about it except that, for example, it was neutral and, and there were different types of neutrinos, such as the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. We thought that it was uh, massless. It had no mass, uh, which turned out uh, some years ago that actually was not the case. And in fact, uh, neutrinos have a tiny, tiny mass. Um, but, uh, for example, what's the antiparticle of the neutrino and, and, and what can explain the uh, mass of the neutrino? These are still open questions. And, and, and what becomes challenging is that the neutrino, because it's neutral and is so less massive, it has minimal interaction with generic detectors like my detector, which is why we can't detect it. However, there are some very dedicated experiments, uh, such as, for example, an experiment that's being constructed uh, at, uh, in the US at Fermilab at Dune, which is really trying to design uh, dedicated uh, detectors, which will actually try to uh, measure better the properties of the neutrinos and understand them better. And perhaps that will explain a lot of these open questions. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. I'm translator in Spanish. The next question: What are the new technologies 
that people is using in the accelerators? A very good question. And, and here there is a whole range. So I'm not an accelerator expert, I have to admit, already firstly admit, but there is a lot of uh, development, for example, in, in magnet technology. And, and what we want to be doing is if we want to be getting to the next generation colliders, for example, which will collide particles at higher and higher energies, we need to be designing, uh, you know, uh, superconducting magnets uh, with uh, technology that is able to allow us to actually get to those high energies. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, development right now ongoing in that area. There are also completely different um, uh, accelerator technologies, for example, those using uh, plasmas and uh, wakefield accelerators, they're called, which are, are very different from the kind of um, accelerator, let's say, which uh, is used at, at the LHC. So there is, a, it's a very active field of, of research with people thinking about what future accelerators should look like. Thanks, thanks for your answer. Miguel, go ahead, please, with your question. Thank you, thank you, Julian. Um, Dr. Tulika. Uh, you, uh, Higgs, uh, Higgs boson has been called the divine particle. It was predict predicted theoretically and uh, discovered experimentally. And for that reason, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. But what would happen? What would be the implications in the physical world if this, if this uh, particle had not been, let's suppose it does not exist? So what could be the implications in physics? And why, uh, maybe, could you tell us why they call it the divine particle? Thank uh, you. So I, I guess that's a, a very good question. Um, so this, the word, this this came about by a book, which Leon Lederman, you know, the, the name yes. of the series uh, wrote, yeah. which was called the, the God Particle. And, and there are lots of reasons people say for why, you know, it became called that. But it is, in my view, it's the particle that people were really hunting for, for over 50 years, because it was predicted in the 60s. But it, it was really fundamental to our understanding of what we call electroweak symmetry breaking or how particles, fundamental particles get their mass. Without the Higgs, if we had not discovered the Higgs, this is extremely dissatisfying because you just cannot answer some very, very fundamental questions. We still don't know. We we think that the Higgs that you know I was you know that I've just mentioned we've discovered at the LHC is the Higgs that was predicted by Peter Higgs and others. Um, but there are still possibilities that there may be, for example, additional Higgs bosons, and 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 some of these is is really critical for our understanding if the Higgs is the answer in some way or the other to some of our open other questions. And, and so I would say that if the Higgs had not been discovered, we would be designing and, and building different experiments to hunt for it, because it would tell us that maybe something is really weird about it. And, 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 and maybe we can't find it because it's decaying in weird ways, which we can't detect in our detectors. So it was, I would say, people sometimes call it, you know, the holy grail of particle physics in uh, in, in the, the most important particle to, to discover. Uh, thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for your answer. Shall we continue? Sure. Thank you. All right. So uh, just a few words about things I will be using, such as, you know, Feynman diagrams, uh, something we call cross-section, which is the probability that a particular interaction occurs. Um, there are units called burns, which has a uh, history coming back from how it was used in the fission era to describe the size of a you know, uranium nucleus is usually in centimeter square or area square. And all of this comes together because you combine the cross section, this quantity sigma with the luminosity, which is the, a, a function of the, the machine and a measure of the number of collisions that can be produced in detector per centimeter square and per second, giving us this event rate, this quantity N. 
sometimes you will hear the term what's called integrated luminosity, so many inverse femtobonds, et cetera, which is really referring to how large our data set is because it is giving us an idea of the number of events we, we've collected. Now, where the Higgs was concerned, uh, it was predicted that, you know, in, in a way, if, if this was to be existing, there would be different production modes. And so these are different Feynman diagrams, which correspond to different ways in which the Higgs can be produced. I don't have time to go into each of these, but I just want to give you an idea of how detailed uh, our, our searches are, because we understand that it may be produced in all of these different ways. Some of them, such as the one on the top, which is called gluon gluon fusion, has the highest sort of rate. So clearly we want to look for that, but we also want to look for the others production modes because maybe they have better signal over background and maybe better in some cases to look for. We also look for what are called different ways in which the Higgs decays. I've already mentioned, for example, Higgs decaying to two Z bosons. It can also decay to two Ws or to bottom quarks or to taus or to photons. And depending on the mass of the Higgs, uh, some of these possibilities have a larger rate of happening, for example, in comparison to others. But as I had mentioned before, we didn't know what the mass of the Higgs was going to be. So we had to be prepared to search for the Higgs in all of these different ways. Now, how is it that actually we do this? Well, particles interact. We are talking about collisions that happen. And in most of these collisions, which are happening at, say, you know, the main interaction point, the, what is produced, these particles decay very close to it. So we measure the, the event vertex where the interaction is happening using tracking information. Now, as I'd shown before, there can be a lot of sort of uh, what I call background things, pile up, the low momentum things. We want to be able to reject that. And then we can, for example, use information from our tracking detectors, how a charged particle bends in a tracking detector tells us what its momentum is, how it bends this way or the other way tells us about its charge. So we use that information, we use the information of energy that's measured in the calorimeters, and then we plug it into what you may have learned in, in relativity, et cetera, to get, if you have E and if you have P, you can get to what the mass is, or in other words, start to identify particles. And so if you can, for example, look for a decay where the Z decays into an electron and positron, by figuring out the electron and positron, you can get the invariant mass of its parent particle. And if you find that its invariant mass is 91 GeV, which is the mass of the Z boson, you've got it. So in the case for the Higgs, this is the case on the top right, you see a Higgs which decays into two Zs, one of the Zs decays into a mu plus, mu minus, and the other Z decays into an E plus, E minus. So we try to reconstruct each of these Z bosons and then see if these two Zs come from the same point, the same parent particle, and if so, what's the invariant mass of that? And we get that that is about 127 GeV in this case. So we say, and we theorize, there is a particle which has a mass of about 126, 27 GeV that has characteristics or signatures similar to a Higgs to ZZ decay. But of course, one of these is not going to make a discovery. But what we saw in that first data set that we collected back in run one was, and this is a plot on the right, which shows in blue the different background processes in black points with the bars are the data points. And around here, about 125 GV, you see the data points match up with the simulation for what 125 GV Higgs would look like. We basically saw an excess of events at around 125 GV, which was above and beyond the blue background. And we found that this could be consistent with the Higgs. However, if so, the Higgs just does not only decay into Zs, it also decays into photons, it also decays into Ws, so we should look be, be looking for those. So indeed we did. So we tried to, on the left-hand side, you see where the Higgs decays into two photons. So we tried to find the invariant mass of two photons in the falling distribution is the background prediction, and around 125 GV, we see a bit of an excess here. And the interesting thing is, 
This is exactly at the same point as the one on the right. So two different decay modes, both of sh them showing a parent particle at 125 GeV, in one case decaying into two photons, and in the other case decaying into two Z bosons. So that gave us confidence that we have something because it's showing up in many different ways, not just one, and there are lots of events which are starting to show. And we got further confidence when we as in CMS produced this result and our competing experiment Atlas produced exactly a very similar result with the particle exactly at around the same mass, which gave the whole world the confidence that we had discovered the Higgs. So I can go on in case there are any questions, but otherwise I will talk about what we've been doing since we discovered the Higgs. I'll pause in case there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your talk. Yes, there are some, some questions. For instance, um, how do they reconstruct uh, interesting events? Okay, so, um, well, there, there are, I think I'll, I'll go back to this picture. So we, a priori, we do not know if it's interesting, right? We are just, we try to reconstruct whatever we can reconstruct. Firstly, we have constraints that we can't write out all of our data. So our first choices are made in the trigger where we say, if I have, you know, an electron and a positron above a certain momentum, it's potentially interesting and I'm going to keep that event. Later on, when we are doing a more detailed analysis, we uh, try to see, we, what we find is really from our detectors information of there is some particle that has deposited energy in the calorimeter and that has left tracks in the tracker. We don't know what that is. So we're kind of like, you, you can almost think of like detectives, you know, solving a murder mystery. A murder has happened and who is the murderer? What we have are clues in our detector, tracks and hits. And, and, and we try to pull all of these different pieces together. And if we start to see that there is a trend, that there is a particle that left a track in the tracking detector and deposited energy in the calorimeter, ah, perhaps that's an electron. Now, let me see if I can look at how much the uh, charge track has bent because I get the momentum. And now if the momentum is substantially high, that means it's potentially coming from some high massive particle. If it's a low momentum, then it's probably background and pile up. So by putting in these requirements, uh, firstly identifying objects such as electrons, muons, jets, which are hadrons in our detector, and then looking for typically, not always, high momentum thresholds. So large momentum, large amounts of energy, we start to think, okay, this is interesting. And we have C++ algorithms that then combine information from all of the detectors to come up with the full picture. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. I'm going to read directly from the chat the next question. Did you think the graviton is going to be fined in the LHC? I, I hope so. So uh, the graviton is indeed one of these um, hypothetical particles. So as I've mentioned, gravity is the fact that we cannot explain gravity in the standard model is very, very unsatisfying. So there are theories out there which predict that there is this particle called the graviton that um, exists. And, and, and if it were to exist, there are certain ways in which it would decay and has certain properties. And in fact, in fact, some of my own students are, are doing uh, searches using LHC data, trying to look for those uh, specific uh, signatures uh, by which we may be able to identify a graviton if it were to exist. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. Another question is, is it possible to explain the origin of electric charge in the same way as mass? Ooh, that's uh, uh, an excellent question. I am. I have to say, I, I don't think I know the answer to this question and I don't know if 
oh, maybe some others, maybe, but I'd have to ask my theorist friends, but no. Uh, electric charge is again one of those you know fundamental properties uh the uh the idea of mass comes out of uh, what we call electroweak symmetry breaking which is would be probably a whole seminar by itself uh so they they, they are they are distinct uh in that sense charge is a fundamental property we hope we understand it better one day thanks thanks for your answer Thanks also for giving this interesting seminar. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but we appreciate your time and knowledge. Do you want to say some closing remarks for your public? Sure, I, I can say is maybe I will just go to my one slide, which um, I think, you know, as, as I said, I focused on the, the Higgs discovery and how we've enabled it using our detectors and, and everything. However, uh, even though we've discovered the Higgs, there is a lot of open questions about whether it's elementary, whether it's composite, how does it couple to other particles? And, and, and so all of the work that we are doing right now is really trying to understand, uh, are there exotic Higgs decays, additional Higgs boson? Does the Higgs boson, and will it be able to explain dark matter? And so I think we're at a very exciting time with lots and lots of data that is available and a whole lot more, about 95% of the LHC data is still to come. And, and with that, over the course of the next uh, 10, 15 years, uh, we really hope to be able to get to the, the bottom of, of these questions and help answer some of the fundamental questions uh, facing us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. We'll all of us enjoy it. And um, have a good evening. Thank you very much for your comments and questions. I enjoyed answering them.